I realized that I was in a life or death struggle. That uh, all of a sudden he was no longer a loud mouth, that he was now uh, a very definite threat. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and this is Just Thought Lounge. The case that we're looking at today isn't a whodunit. There is no doubt that on the 13th of January 2014, 71-year-old Curtis Reeves shot and killed 43-year-old father and husband Chad Olson inside of a movie theater near Tampa, Florida. The question in this case is whether Reeves fired his pistol over scattered popcorn, as the state prosecution would argue years later, or was this an act of self-defense by a terrified elderly man? Let's take a look. January 13th, 2014 was a Monday. Chad Olson, formerly of the United States Navy, worked a Tuesday through Sunday schedule as a finance manager at Sky Power Sports. Sky is an ATV and watercraft dealership based in Port Ritchie, Florida. Chad was an avid dirt bike rider and motocross enthusiast. He was also a father to a two-year-old daughter, Alexis. On that Monday, Chad's wife Nicole, then 33 years old, had taken the day off work so she could go on a date with her husband. The two left little Alexis in daycare and headed out for lunch and maybe some shopping. Afterwards, they decided to take in an afternoon matinee at the Wesley Chapel Theatre. Elsewhere near Tampa that morning, another couple were making plans to go see a film. Curtis Reeves, a retired Tampa police captain, and his wife Vivian planned to meet their son Mark at the early afternoon viewing of Mark Wahlberg's latest flick, Lone Survivor. Curtis had been retired since 1993. He had a highly decorated career in law enforcement, which saw him in roles from patrolman to homicide detective. Before calling it quits, he established the agency's first SWAT team. In retirement, Curtis Reeves accepted the position as director of security for Bush Gardens, but by 2014, he had left this role as well. Curtis and Vivian's son Mark had followed in his father's footsteps and became a police officer in Tampa. They also have a daughter, Jennifer, whose daughter was their only grandchild. She was just over two years old at the time, much like little Alexis Olson. The Olsons arrive at Wesley Chapel Theatre first and made their way to the second to last row centered in front of the screen in theatre number 10 showing Lone Survivor. After their seats are selected, Chad left for the concession stand to grab some snacks. Vivian and Curtis Reeves arrive separate from Mark and find their own seats. On their way into the theater, they pass a sign instructing patrons not to carry their concealed weapons, knives or guns, into the theater. Curtis, as a habit from decades in law enforcement, carried a pistol in his right pocket. They settled in the very last row with their backs against a tall wall behind the Olsons. The seating behind them was reserved for the bistro and had a separate entry and exit. Vivian sat directly behind Chad, while Curtis's seat was positioned behind where Nicole sat. The lights dim, a courtesy message to turn off and put away all cell phones played on the screen. Really? This is the most important scene your cell phone rings? And the film trailers for future films and other advertisements began playing on the screen. The next few minutes would be rehashed repeatedly by numerous moviegoers as future witnesses in subsequent years. Chad Olson took out his cell phone in the dimly lit theater to message his daughter's daycare and check in before the movie started. He also checked Facebook and some other random things apparently. Catching the glare from Chad's screen, Curtis Reeves leans down and asks him to put it away. Chad refuses. Curtis then gets up and leaves Theater 10 in search of a manager to make a complaint and impose the cell phone rules. He finds a general manager, Thomas Peck, and speaks with him briefly to lodge his complaint. Thomas chooses not to return with Curtis to the theater. When Curtis does return to his seat, only a few minutes later, he finds that Chad had put away his phone. The incident appeared to be over, but this is actually when the confrontation heats up. Words are exchanged between the two men. Curtis Reeves is perhaps the instigator and pushes and prods a response from Chad, getting in at least one last jab at the man for having had his phone out. Or Chad's pent up frustration at the old man reporting him to the manager boils over or some combination of reactions occurs to intensify the situation. Chad Olson stands. He grabs the popcorn from Curtis Reeves' lap and throws it in his face. The older man is hit not just with popcorn, but also possibly he is hit in the head with Chad Olson's cell phone, knocking his glasses from their place on his head. A moment later, before the popcorn even hits the ground, Curtis Reeves pulls his pistol from his pocket and fires a single shot. It hits Chad Olson in the chest, but its path also runs through Nicole Olson's hand straight through her ring finger. 
Curtis Reeves was not the only one in the theater that day to disregard the no weapons policy. Off-duty deputy Alan Hamilton was sitting with his wife Angela in the back row only a few seats down from the Reeves when the shot was fired. Hamilton had his firearm tucked away in Angela's handbag but would not have cause to use it. Identifying himself, deputy Hamilton secured the pistol from Curtis Reeves, who after firing his single shot at the Olsons had sat back, some said calmly, and placed the weapon on his lap. Many moviegoers rushed from the theater tent into the lobby, while others rushed to assist Chad Olson, who had taken a few steps away after being shot and collapsed to the floor. Did there come a time when Mr. Olson was walking towards you? Yes, he was starting to walk towards. Prior to getting to where you were, almost at your feet, prior to falling, what, if anything, did he say? He said, I can't believe he shot me. Did Mr. Olson fall at your feet? He did. He fell at my feet and, and he also hit my son as he was falling. We start, well, somebody came up behind me, but I, when he went to my feet and his head was on my left foot, I started resuscitation as best as I could. I wasn't sure where the bullet wound was, but I could feel blood on my hand. Okay. So my initial reaction was, of course, I want to make sure it was safe before I went over to check on Chad. So once I saw that there was no more shooting and that there was no more any type of violence occurring, I went to uh, Chad's side. It was still a little bit dim. Um, I saw blood coming from his shirt and then at that point I called 911. Did you? While emergency responders assisted the Olsons, Curtis Reeves was taken into custody by police and placed in the back of a cruiser. Here, Detective Alan Proctor interviewed Reeves about the shooting. Reeves told police that Chad Olson was explosive and very aggressive. He says that the younger man had scared the shit out of him. The conversation was recorded. So he's coming over on me. I got a, I'm pushing him off with my left hand and I had a hold of something. I'm assuming it was probably his chest. I made contact with something, his arm, his chest, his shoulder. Up. I'm saying, no, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you think that he had something other than a cell phone? I, uh, I had no idea what, what he had. I mean, I just, I, mean, I just, I, all I knew is that guy was coming after me. It's dark, the theater's dark, the show's on. I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know him. I don't know, I, I see that he's very explosive, uh, un, unnecessarily. Uh, like I said, after he hit me, my face went sideways. My bass is came partially off. I, by now, I'm stretched out completely. I'm in my seat, kind of like this with my left hand out, and and when I shot, he was, hell, it should have been pretty darn close to the contact. So what made you shoot him? Well, I, I guess uh, it scared the hell out of me. Okay. I thought the guy was fixing to beat the out of me. Okay. I don't know how else to say that. Vivian Reeves also gave a recorded statement to police. Although she saw less of the incident than her husband, she does see Chad Olson rise from his seat and curse at Curtis Reeves before the shot is heard. I don't even know who said something first, but the guy said, who the f do you think? And he stood up and leaned over, and then I heard the pop. Chad Olson passed away from the single gunshot wound to the chest. Nicole had emergency treatment for her hand and the reconstruction of her finger. The charge against Curtis Reeves was now presumed to be of second-degree murder. The casing from the shot was documented on the floor of the theater near where Curtis Reeves sat. The spilled popcorn as well as Chad Olson's iPhone were also sitting on the floor in the aisle of the last row. The next day, Curtis Reeves made his first court appearance with defense attorney Richard Escobar, who argued his client acted in self-defense and should not be considered a flight risk or danger to the public. After a short hearing though, Circuit Judge Lynn Tepper orders that Reeves be held in the Lando Lakes Jail without the possibility of bail as he awaited trial. A far more extensive bond hearing lasting over two days and containing over 12 hours of testimony was held in early February. At the hearing, Curtis's daughter Jennifer testified to his deteriorating physical state, laying out a key component of his future defense. Some kind of, any kind of physical problems your father had while he was playing with Madison? Well, I mean, 
as far as picking her up, so you can sometimes tell if he's. She, I think, I think at Monday's appointment she weighed like twenty six and a half pounds. But as far as picking her up and things like that, um, sometimes Dad, you can see him favor one or the other shoulder when he picks her up. Um, he will push her in her swing in the backyard. She likes for people to get on the floor and play with her, and she'll always say, sit papa, or sit grandma, or you know, to sit on the floor with her. And um, he's just really not able to do that. When he does get down there, it's not easy getting up. Um. The judge ordered Reeves held on bail. While Nicole Olson appears visibly relieved, this proved to be only the first of many steps along the way to a trial for Chad's murder. Reeves' defense team appealed the decision and eventually won his release. In July 2014, after seven months, Reeves was released on $150,000 bail. The conditions of his release on house arrest required him to wear a standard ankle monitor for GPS tracking at all times, allowing only for trips to the grocery store, his attorney's office, religious services, and for medical treatment. Reeves also is ordered to surrender all firearms to the Pasco Sheriff's Office. The case of the popcorn murder saw increased local and national media coverage over this period. And with Curtis Reeves' photo all over Tampa News, he was recognized. A couple of fellow moviegoers from around the region emerged with their own stories of Reeves' alleged past behavior. Edward Thompson came forward with a story of being screamed at by Reeves at a local cinema in 2006. Evidently, the encounter was memorable enough to recall eight years later. Thompson believed that Reeves was purposely picking a fight and forcing a confrontation. He's sitting in the seat and he turns like this and looks back towards us and he says, why don't you shut up? And what did you think when they let him out? Are they crazy? <laughs> this guy's a killer. Edward Thompson is not the only one with such a story about Reeves. Michael and Jamira Dixon recounted being at the same Wesley Chapel Theater where Chad Olson was killed only weeks before and being aggressively scolded by Reeves for texting during the previews. Jamira was made even more uncomfortable later when she says Reeves followed her while she exited the theater for the restroom. And I was like, oh my God, what is wrong with this guy? Gets up. He's like, can you do me a favor? Can you please just stop texting when the staff left? He became more irate. Spoke of an angry, irritated, older gentleman who just couldn't stand the world. Despite what appeared on the surface as a pattern of behavior, neither the Dixons or Edward Thompson would be called upon to give testimony against Reeves. Meanwhile, Nicole Olson was also taking advantage of the media's attention of the case to tell her side of the story. The gunshot wound will heal, you know, it's a finger. The real pain is in my heart. There was a conversation. The um, gentleman had confronted my husband several times, which my husband ignored and ignored and ignored. Mm -hmm. And then it just got to a point where my husband spoke up, and that's when he shot him. He was shot. Nicole's version of events contrasted to the one told by the Reeves. Curtis's claims of self-defense complicated the state's ability to bring charges against him. Under Florida law at the time, a controversial stand your ground rule allowed for immunity against murder charges under certain circumstances. The law says a person has no duty to retreat when faced with a violent confrontation and can use deadly force if he or she fears death or great bodily harm. So in 2015, Reeves' defense team files a motion to dismiss the criminal charges and lays out the self-defense argument. Only a few months later, Nicole and her lawyer are also busy filing a civil lawsuit against Cobb Theatres, the company owning the cinema, Oakley Grove Development that owns the complex where the cinema is located, and Thomas Peck, the general manager of the theater. When the news um, came out with the lawsuit and the comments about people saying it's all about money, it's all about money, or you know whatever they want to say about me, that's fine, that's their opinion. Money to me will not bring Chad back, it won't you know, give me quality time with Lexi, it won't give me happiness. So to me, it's not about money. Um, people that know me know my heart and know that I'm doing this from a good place. And that, um, you know, to me, it's about two things. One is making change so that nobody else has to go through what I went through. And two is what we just talked about, you know, me being able to share my story and to be able to help others in a positive way. The complaint asserted that Peck was negligent for not acting more urgently when Reeves left the theater to complain to management about Chad Olson's behavior. 
the civil lawsuit was placed on hold until the criminal proceedings could be worked out. Ultimately, it would take to December 2020 before the suit was dismissed. Court documents show that Nicole reached a private settlement with those named in the lawsuit, but no further details are available. The Stand Your Ground hearing began in February 2017, and it lasted two weeks. If Reeves' team won, he would not continue to face charges to Chad Olson's murder. Over half a dozen witnesses from the movie theater were called to testify to what they could remember of the brief and heated exchange that preceded Reeves' gunshot. Legal commentators told local news that standing your ground may be difficult to apply in an altercation where the violent confrontation appears to be an attack with popcorn. But there is also an acknowledgement that the use of deadly force in defending oneself is easier justified when the person is deemed too frail to respond by any other means. The pistol became the great equalizer in the confrontation. I realized that I was in a life or death struggle. That uh, all of a sudden he was no longer a loud mouth, he was now a, a very definite threat. That's when the pistol came out. And what did you do with that pistol? I shot him. Did you want to shoot him? Absolutely not. So why did you shoot him? <coughs> well, <coughs> at that point it was his life or mine. After the two weeks of testimony, Judge Susan Barthel issued an order denying Reeves' request for immunity from prosecution. In her decision, she says that she believes that video security footage from the theater shows that Reeves was not in fear of bodily harm or death. Much would still be said about that video, but as for the threshold of the law, Judge Barthel says that Reeves didn't meet it. This meant that murder charges could be pursued. After several years of legally imposed delays already, many involved believe that Reeves may never face trial at all. The case has been delayed three years now, and I think that Mr. Escobar understands that the longer the delay, the better it is for his client. Curtis Reeves is almost 75 years old and still out on bond. I think they're going to do everything and anything that they can in order to delay uh, that criminal trial, not only because of his age, but because they want memories to fade more. As predicted, Judge Barthel's decision was promptly appealed, further delaying any potential murder trial. In May 2018, the District Court of Appeals declined to reverse the decision. When the trial finally commenced, the central assertion is that Chad Olson lost his life over nothing more than popcorn. One of those two individuals brought a loaded firearm into a theater and shot and killed another person after popcorn was tossed in. Really? He grabbed a bag of popcorn. And he grabbed that bag of popcorn and he brought it back and he flicked it at the defendant. Now, the evidence will show you, of course, in a perfect world, should Chad Olson have grabbed a bag of popcorn and tossed it on the defendant? Well, of course not. The evidence will show you you can't shoot and kill another person over that. What the evidence will show you is that Chad Olson was shot and killed over tossing popcorn. And is this over popcorn? It is not. First of all, we know it's about the popcorn because that's the statement. Don't lose fact of that. Okay? When you, if you hear, oh, a, a hand's coming at him, he reasonably believes because a hand was coming at him. No, he killed them because of the popcorn because he said that right after the shooting. Throw popcorn in my face. He knew what happened. And when you watch the video, you see the popcorn and you see from the hip the shot. That's this case. The next thing I observe is Popcorn in the air. All right. Oh. Do you know how it got in the air? I do not know how it got in the air. What's the next thing that happens? Flash shot. Or soon thereafter, did you hear Mr. Reeves make a statement? Yes, I did. Okay. What did you hear him say? Something along the lines of throw popcorn in my face or throw popcorn at me. Okay. The defense presented an argument that a combination of two significant factors were at work during the altercation. First, that Curtis Reeves' years of experience and knowledge in law enforcement informed his understanding of the threat that Chad Olson posed to him. Reeves knew better than most people how damaging and potentially life-threatening even a single closed-fisted hit could be. Secondly, after so many years in policing and security, time and old injuries had caught up with the elderly man. He was in far worse physical shape than he perhaps appeared, and this knowledge made him extremely vulnerable and easily threatened. 
To understand the context of self-defense in this case, the jury was asked to place themselves in Curtis Reeves' shoes. What the prosecutor has to prove, what the government has to prove, what the state of Florida has to prove in this case, beyond a reasonable doubt, that this was not justifiable. Under the same circumstances as Curtis Reeves, you can decide if it's reasonable if you were trained like Curtis Reeves. You're going to decide if it's reasonable if you're 71 years old. And although the prosecutor is telling you he walked all right, he did all this and that, you're going to hear from experts. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that, about what the realities of the aging process are. To show that Curtis Reeves was the aggressor, the prosecution introduced witnesses that heard him muttering to himself after the initial exchange with Chad Olson while he leaves Theater 10 to find Thomas Peck, the manager, to complain. Charles Cummings testifies that Reeves is so worked up that he hits him while trying to move past his seat down the aisle and doesn't even acknowledge it. Once out at the service desk, however, Don Simpson sees Curtis wait patiently for his turn to speak with the manager. She takes up Peck's attention, discussing acquiring some movie posters for her daughter. Thomas Peck confirms this version of events. Curtis was not visibly upset and was generally polite. In fact, Thomas doesn't accompany the older man back into the theater to address the issue because he does not perceive the incident as very noteworthy. One way that the defense attempts to frame Chad Olson as the aggressor is by highlighting his use of obscenities towards the Reeves. In his recorded statement to police after the shooting, Curtis claims that the F-word was used towards him three to four times, and it was threatening. He reiterates this when he takes the stand at his trial. Uh, please turn this on. Uh, it was a uh, uh, fuck off, get the fuck out of my face was the response that I got back. He was facing away from me, but he was saying it loud enough to where I heard it. Did your husband uh, use any profanity? No. Uh, we refer to him as F-bombs. Any F-bombs being directed towards the, the man behind you? No. By your husband? No. Okay, so Mr. Olson was facing Mr. Reeves when we made a comment about texting. Yes, sir. Okay, do you remember if there was, and I'm not going to say the word, but an, an F-word in there? Yes, sir. Okay, that's what you heard? Yes, sir. So at that point, I saw um, the outline of a person stand up and then say something along the lines of texting my daughter. There were some other words I really couldn't understand what was said, but it was like, a, like, a, like an annoyed voice, like texting my daughter. The security footage is no help in resolving these discrepancies. It only partially depicts the shooting and has no audio, which are a couple of its many limitations. The cameras are on either side of the theater, but are set up to capture the back portion of the seating behind the wall where the Reeves were sitting, there are no cameras in place to capture the main seating area. The resolution on the footage is awful. The central point of curiosity is a reflection caught by the camera only a moment before the popcorn was thrown. If Curtis Reeves' testimony is to be believed, that reflection could be caused by the screen of Chad Olson's cell phone being thrown at his head. He had turned and was on his feet, and, and I've, I had uh, something between me and the theater screen that I, I saw a, just a flash of a reflection off of. And, and then, I, then everything went kind of uh, fuzzy. If that... Did you believe at that point that you had been hit? Yes, sir, I did. And where do you uh, think that you were hit at that moment? I think I was hit on my glasses on the, 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 the top left side. That, that was where I felt the, uh, the impact, I think. And, uh, I wasn't sure how it had happened because I, I didn't think he was that close to me. So, at some point at that at that time, I, I had no other choice, and I reached for my pistol. Chad's cell phone is found on the floor by Reeves' feet after the shooting. A red mark is visible on Curtis Reeves' head above his left eye. One witness, Joanna Turner, testifies to seeing something being thrown by Chad at Curtis right before he starts throwing the popcorn. She thinks maybe it was a mug or some kind of thermos, but in retrospect, maybe it was a cell phone. The defense team called an expert, Donna Cohen, a professor from the University of South Florida and an expert in aging. She told the jury that as a person ages, they feel more vulnerable, especially when threatened. Roy Bedard is a law enforcement trainer and an expert in decision making under pressure, particularly for those trained and experienced in law enforcement like Curtis Reeves. 
He says decisions must be viewed in light of the totality of the circumstances. By this, he means that everything in the environment, from the level of lighting impacting vision, the levels of sound and hearing, to how old someone is, and by extension, how capable or vulnerable they are if they are faced with a physical altercation, will feed into the reasoning of any decision under pressure. Bedard also testifies that the less you know about the threat in front of you, the more likely you are to assume the worst case scenario. It has to do with the lighting conditions, you know, whether or not you're capable of seeing. If you have a tool to your avail, for example, a flashlight, you would probably use that. If you don't, you may choose that this is not the best time to go down that dark alley. Um, there are circumstances about vision. As I said, there may be a case of um, where uh, an individual is partially hidden and you can't quite see what they're doing. And so that would figure into your um, threat assessment as well. And then there are also individual fe features, what we call subject factors, like for example, how old are you and how, uh, how, how, how capable are you of fighting? Are you bigger than the person? Do you have martial arts experience? Do you have a weapon on you? All of those kind of things would be taken into account when you're trying to examine whether or not this is merely a challenge for which you have the appropriate coping mechanisms or it is a threat for which your coping mechanisms are now exceeded. Reeves was technically facing three charges at trial, second degree murder, a lesser charge of manslaughter, as well as a charge of aggravated battery for the injury caused in Nicole's hand. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty on all three counts. Observers in the courtroom appeared visibly surprised, but quiet while the verdict was read. The defendant is not guilty, so say we all this 25th day of February 2022 those who disagreed with the decision claimed that the defense counsel Escobar and Reeves's other attorneys argued successfully that he shouldn't go to jail because he is an old man, not because of what was lawful and just in this case. The only case that they made to the jury and the only way they got this verdict was not on the facts of the case or even the law of the case. Mr. Escobar was capable after four hours of talking to the jury to convince them that his client should not go to jail because he's just a fragile old man. Thanks once again for joining me for the video today. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.